Great. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Patterson. Uh, as Dr. Patterson uh, said, my name is Brian Mason. I'm one of the third year residents here. Um, and it's my pleasure to present today on green light laser prostatectomy. Um, now, this is a bit of a controversial subject, especially around VGH uh, and the area. And uh, when I mentioned to Dr. McLaughlin that I was going to do this presentation, that was his reaction. <laughs> Dr. Patterson was uh, quite similar. Um, I'm just hoping that Dr. Sows doesn't look like that. <laughs> um, so let me tell you my biases right up front. When I uh, first came up with this talk idea, my idea was to trash green light laser. Um, and let, let me tell you why. Here's, here's a case that I saw around Christmas time. A uh, 68-year-old Caucasian gentleman presented to St. Paul's Hospital um, with uh, some complications secondary uh, to this procedure. He was an otherwise healthy uh, gentleman, no medical history of note. He had been seen in the Vancouver area previously with bothersome urinary symptoms. He actually had a, a large PVR, was in urinary retention, and was started on alpha blockade and clean intermittent catheterization. Uh, there was talk about doing a TURP on him, um, and then he disappeared. He uh, elected to have a green light laser pr uh, prostate done at a high volume center in the United States, uh, done by a very well respected uh, physician who does a large uh, volume of these. Uh, apparently, the procedure itself uh, went well, but he did require catheterization post off of day number two. Uh, he came back to Canada, restarted his clean intermittent catheterizations, um, and after two weeks did start to void volitionally, continued with his CAC, uh, but did have some stress urinary incontinence. One month uh, post-operatively, um, it just so happened to be right around Christmas and I was on call and was very pleased to be seeing him. Uh, he presented to St. Paul's Hospital with pelvic pain and bilateral leg swelling. He was seen by the uh, internist, uh, infectious disease due to severe pain in his pelvis. Uh, he had limited mobility, was unable to move his legs very well, and had swelling in both uh, thigh compartments. He uh, had urine cultures that were positive for E. coli and was started on broad spectrum coverage for this, and <clears throat> imaging uh, uh, was ordered. Uh, thigh ultrasounds were done that showed uh, collections on both sides. These were aspirated coming back with a fluid creatinine consistent with urine in his thighs. Um, for this reason, a CT cystogram and voiding uh, cystourethrogram were done. Uh, the VCU images show a large bladder with multiple diverticuli. Um, and of note, is this not uh, coming up very well? Can you see that on your slide? There's... Uh, <coughs> This final image is the important one here. Is that showing up at all? Looks great on my screen. Um, what if I change the background, Jason? Will it show up better? Okay. Anyways, take my word for it on the, on the uh, VCU uh, post-void study. After, um, uh, after void, there was a blush of contrast anterior to the pubic symphysis. Uh, CT cystogram was done. Um, and as we scroll through the images, you can see a blush of contrast just anterior uh, to the pubic symphysis. Uh, the clinical diagnosis of osteitis pubis was made uh, with bilateral uh, thigh urinomas. These were aspirated and he was started on broad spectrum antibiotics with Foley catheter drainage. Dr. Leone saw him in follow-up uh, shortly after this for uh, cystoscopy. And uh, this is a, a video courtesy of Dr. Leone of the cystoscopic images. And hopefully it uh, projects there for you. <clears throat> As you can see, you get into the prostatic fossa, which is reasonably wide open, um, but just anteriorly, we'll see here, 
Dr. Leone was actually able to get up into an anterior false passage that's quite sizable. So he had a big <coughs> connection between his uh, anterior prostatic fossa and his pubic symphysis. A uh, pretty catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he left the anterior part of the prostate and there was a big hole made. So, you know, when I started doing these rounds, this was in the back of my mind. The only published results to this uh, time point were something like this and this and this even. Uh, and all I had seen was this. Uh, so that's my motivation for these grand rounds. And hopefully it uh, gets some discussion going. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about the laser physics. Uh, then some of the procedural considerations, uh, the procedure itself, and then look at some clinical and economic outcomes uh, versus the gold standard of TURP. And then there's a few special circumstances and, and address some of the common criticisms of green light laser. Um, so the surgical indications for BPH have not changed. Uh, it still plays a role in those with refractory uh, retention, uh, persistent gross hematuria, bladder stones, current urinary tract infections or renal insufficiency in those who uh, fail medical management or choose not to go that route. There's no doubt TURP remains the gold standard uh, to which all of these new procedures are being compared. Um, since its introduction about a decade ago, lasers have uh, continued to be investigated for an alternative to the gold standard of TURP. Uh, laser prostatectomy does encompass a wide variety of lasers um, that come in multiple types, coagulative lasers being a neodymium YAG, cutting lasers that we have here, the homium YAG, and uh, the vaporization lasers. And what we'll talk about today are the KTP and the lithium uh, triborate, uh, or the green light lasers. The green light laser hasn't been around that long. Um, back in the late 1990s, uh, it was being used as a hybrid technique with the neodymium lasers. Uh, and it wasn't until 1998 that Malik and his group uh, in the U.S. described 10 patients treated with a 60-watt KTP pure laser. And that was the first study back in 1998. It wasn't until 2004 uh, that there was the first prospective trial done. These uh, results, you know, are very early. We'll look at more meaningful results later, but this is just a little bit about the history. Uh, the green light laser itself, uh, as some of you might be aware, <clears throat> most of the data is uh, with the 80 watt or the green light PV system. That was the, the system that False Creek had. Um, it was found that the power uh, on this was not sufficient to do large glands. It took a long time uh, to uh, resect, and <laughs> some people had uh, poor experiences with this uh, system. Um, most of the published results are on this 80 watt system. The new, uh, newer green light uh, HPS system uses a 120 watt system, and we'll look at some of the difference in these a little bit later. So keep this in mind when looking at the data. The uh, green light PV system was approved in Canada uh, in 2004, with the uh, HPS approved in 2007. A little look at the laser physics. Why is it called green light? Uh, well, the KTP laser is at uh, 532 nanometers, which falls within the green light uh, of the visible spectrum. <clears throat> this here is a plot of uh, absorption of light versus wavelength. And as you can see here at the, uh, at the 532 nanometer wavelength, uh, we can look at the absorption of oxyhemoglobin versus water. So in essence, the absorption of tissue versus the absorption of the irrigant. And uh, at 532 nanometers, the absorption of the oxyhemoglobin curve uh, far outweighs that of the, uh, the water. This correlates theoretically into the energy being transferred to the tissues as opposed to the irrigant. Uh, if we look at some of the other versions that we might be familiar with, the neodymium YAG doesn't show this uh, differential. And the homium YAG actually uh, is absorbed by irrigant um, greater than the tissue. Um, this correlates into contact, so homium YAG needing tissue contact, 
uh, the HPS system or the green light 532 nanometer not needing uh, contact with the tissue. Now laser interacts with, with uh, tissue in, in multiple ways. Uh, if the temperature uh, is spread and doesn't reach a rapid uh, rise above 100 uh, degrees Celsius, the denaturing of the protein leads to a coagulative effect. Um, and this, uh, if the energy is spread over less area and its rapid expansion to greater than 100 degrees Celsius, uh, you get rapid expansion of fluid bubbles within the tissue that causes a vaporization effect. And we'll see that actually a little bit later when we watch the videos of bubbles being released as the tissue is actually vaporized. So the shorter wavelength and high uh, absorption coefficient of 532 nanometers uh, leads to a, a narrower zone of coagulation. The, uh, the zone of coagulation was thought to have contributed to the irritate avoiding symptoms and the sloughing of tissue and the, uh, the urinary retention that was seen in, in earlier and different uh, laser treatments, like uh, VLAP with the neodymium YAG, or the earliest uh, versions of the 60 watt, the, uh, the KTP laser. Uh, as you can see here in the, the green light, it's reported that uh, the wavelength penetrates the tissue less than 0.8 of a millimeter, which leads to a, a very small 1 to 2 millimeter zone of coagulation. Uh, allows for efficient hemostasis, but not deep uh, tissue necrosis and sloughing. Uh, going back to the two different systems, Dr. McLaughlin? Uh, the question from Dr. McLaughlin is, has there been any, uh, any talk about impedance? Uh, say we get tissue coagulum, how does, the, uh, how does the penetration change? And there have been no reported uh, studies based upon the, the coagulum or the impedance. The only one I'm aware of is uh, on, on uh, canine prostates where they, they did an initial laser insult. Uh, that's what this data comes from. They did a, a laser insult without a coagulum and they measured it and that's where they got the one to two millimeter zone. This is all like you, you probably are thinking is theoretical and how does it translate into the patient, but this is sort of the physics upon which this system was, was built. Uh, so getting back to the PV versus the HPS system, the PV was the one False Creek had. It was 80 watts. It was near contact because of the way that the laser exited uh, the machine. Uh, the newer systems, are the HPS system, are 120 watts. It allows for a three millimeter working distance and that, that comes from improved laser columnation. Um, the way that the laser exits is it's more focused beam. So theoretically, you should get increased tissue permeability. Uh, here we see that the, the HPS at 120 watts, looking at vaporization efficiency. These all come from the company. so. Take it with what you will. There's a couple of other differences in the newer system. It now has two foot pedals, one for coagulation with a lower uh, uh, power setting and one for vaporization and, and actually activation of the uh, laser instead of having to say laser on and get someone to press a button, it's now on top of the foot pedal. Uh, talk a little bit about the procedure itself now. Um, the preoperative evaluation and anesthetic considerations are, are very much similar to TURP. Uh, same positioning can be done under general or local anesthetic with, with many people describing it being done under pudendal block. Some people are doing it in the office setting in the United States, which is kind of a, a fancy OR in an office setting. Um, for straightforward patients otherwise healthy with other comorbidities, it's described as being done as an outpatient procedure, not requiring overnight continuous bladder irrigation. It's a continuous flow cystoscope. Uh, the ones now are 21 to 23 French using normal saline irrigation, which allows uh, for the avoidance of the TUR syndrome. Uh, you advance your single use laser fiber uh, through the continuous flow cystoscope. The laser fiber is about $850 single use. It's uh, side firing, fires at 70 degrees anteriorly. And uh, it has an adapter on the end that you can see there that you can roll the laser fiber within the arc to paint the prostate. Dr. McLaughlin? 
What, pardon me? So it's avoidance of the TURP syndrome. The uh, question by... Yes. Okay, thank you. The, the comment from uh, Dr. Wright was that uh, if you get into the larger veins, even though you're using saline, you can get the uh, acute hyperemia uh, causing the TUR syndrome. And, and we'll look at those results a little bit later. Um, so now a little bit of uh, video here on the surgical procedure for those who haven't, uh, who haven't seen it. And I'll try to uh, get this coming up, Jason. Oh, did I just do that? It's far funnier if you have the ring. It. And I see your <laughs> is as big as mine. Now let's see how well you handle it. <laughs> Can we make it? Okay, anyways. Much like most of my humor, it doesn't work. <laughs> that was Star Wars green light. There's one more uh, video there. It's the last time I tried to be funny. Can we uh, pull up that second example? Okay, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and if it's smaller, does it work better? Does that project at all? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a, a YouTube example. I didn't take the company's uh, CD that they sent me because it looked far too pretty. As you can see, the uh, fiber is under direct visualization. You see the uh, bubble effect as the uh, tissue is uh, vaporized. And in essence, the procedure is very similar to TURP. You open up a visual channel to improve your irrigation. You advance the fiber through, and you sweep through the arc uh, to electrovaporize from the level of the bladder neck to the vera montanum. Uh, in some of these images, you get a good, good idea of the three millimeter working distance that you have with the HPS uh, system, um, allowing for more vaporization as opposed to coagulation, hopefully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the, <coughs> the, the question from, uh, from Dr. So is uh, how much tissue can each, uh, can each fiber handle? The cost of each fiber is $850. Um, each fiber is rated uh, for 250,000 joules, 275,000 joules, which translates into about 100 gram prostate. The some uh, uh, so eight hundred fifty dollars for a hundred gram prostate single use. Uh, it's my understanding that if you have a premature uh, failure of the the fiber that, that, that through the company you can have a second laser fiber uh, for that procedure. So uh, call Hallis from AMS. Uh, the rep says that with the new uh, with the new system, each fiber you could get up to 400 uh, joules. <clears throat> so, sorry about the uh, the projection of that, but in essence, the the procedure is is very similar to TURP. You create a working channel. You do the the median lobe, lateral lobes. Uh, it's continuous painting of the fiber, uh, theoretically, till you get to the capsule, and, and the visualization is similar to TURP, um, and you get that one to three millimeter working distance. Uh, contact with tissue can lead to early fiber uh, degradation. 
Uh, catheterization is generally at the discretion of the surgeon. In general, for routine surgeries, most uh, patients are recommended to have a catheter until the local uh, anesthetic or regional anesthetic is worn off. Uh, in patients at risk for, uh, for failure of trial avoid, often get uh, catheterization overnight or, or uh, for a couple days. In this uh, one study in uh, the Journal of Endo-Urology in 2009, it was the experience of a surgeon of his first 70 patients with a mean prostate volume of approximately 60 cc's. All were treated on the outpatient setting, and 70% and had a catheter successfully removed prior to discharge on the day of surgery. 30% um, failed their trial avoid, uh, or, or didn't have a trial avoid attempted until uh, post-op day number one, and of those, two failed. So how does it stack up? What does this mean? Um, the data is relatively new. The first uh, uh, description not being 1994, and uh, now we're only looking at two large analyses of all the data. Uh, first, the point, they both come out of Canada, one out of Calgary um, and one out of uh, Ontario, so the economic analysis applies possibly more up here. The first uh, paper from Alberta took all literature in the English language up until 2006, and it only came up with one R RCT, one multi-centered cohort study. So those two compared TURP uh, to uh, photovaporization of the prostate. And uh, then it also pooled the data from 12 case control studies. Total of 1,376 patients uh, were available for, for review. Again, these were all the 80-watt uh, procedure. Follow-up in these are range between six and 12 months, so short-term follow-up. When you look at all of the adverse events, when you look at uh, acute renal failure, urinary retention, clot retention, hematuria, dysuria, UTIs, incontinence, uh, stricture rates, epididymitis, erectile dysfunction, retrograde ejaculation, at 12 months, when you compare them to the uh, published TURP, uh, values from based on the 2003 AUA guidelines. Um, all of them were similar with the, uh, with the exception of urinary retention, uh, which favored uh, PVP, uh, clot retention favored PVP, and uh, blood transfusion rates in those 1,300 patients that were none in the PVP group versus the quoted between 5 and 11 percent uh, on uh, TURP. It might be closer to five now. Dr. Leone. Yeah, do you have uh, any data on the IPSS scores uh, and flow rates before and after? Uh, Dr. Leone's question is about the IPSS and flow rates before and after, and, and we'll come uh, after we talk about complications. I'd like to get into the, the, the clinical outcomes uh, from this pooled data. Um, so it'll come up in two slides. So when you look at the two comparative studies, the randomized control trial and the multi-centered cohort trial, uh, when you look at all of these different um, uh, complications that we talked about, acute renal failure, urinary retention, capsular perforation, clot retention, and so on, uh, the, all the measured outcomes showed uh, uh, equality between the TURP group and the PVP group. Now, you might ask, these are small studies, were they just not powered, and that's a possibility. Um, but uh, all of the signal was towards equality except for uh, clot retention, which had a signal favoring PVP as being, uh, being better. Uh, the clinical endpoints, as uh, Dr. Leone was uh, uh, alluding to, looked at operative time, length of hospitalized stay, catheterization time, uh, blood transfusions, and they used the primary outcomes of the peak flow, IPSS, quality of life score, and, and PVRs. When we just look at the operative outcomes here in uh, the 12 uh, pooled studies, the operating time averaged between 20 and 137 minutes, the resection time uh, uh, correlating with uh, gland volume, catheterization time between uh, 7.6 and 4, 43 hours on uh, means from each study. In all of them, uh, the hospital stay was less than 24 hours and reoperation rates uh, mind you, only at 12 months uh, were reported between 0 and 7.5% in the 12 studies. 
Uh, the primary outcomes they looked at were peak flow, PVR, IPSS, and quality of life. And in the pooled data, uh, as well as uh, <clears throat> the, so if we look at the non-randomized control, so that's the pooled data and, and within the randomized control, if you look at these clinical endpoints, neither uh, PVP nor TYP is uh, favored. So they sh were able to, at 12 months, show no differences in primary outcomes, peak flow, PBR, IPSS, and quality of life scores in follow-up. What about money? Uh, if it's equivalent, does it cost more? Well, there were four, this study looked at the four available economic analyses at that time. Uh, there was one study from the United States, one from Australia, Switzerland, and uh, there was a medical advisory uh, analysis out of Ontario to see if they should uh, uh, institute green light. And in all four of these studies, the final conclusion was that actually PVP would be less expensive than transurethral resection of the prostate. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in just a second, but um, right here is that the, of course the upfront capital expenditure on PVP is more. T TURP will be available at most centers, you already have the equipment. The upfront capital expenditure on PVP includes the laser system, which is $150,000, <clears> and then the consumables being the laser fibers, $850 per case versus a, a, a loop and a roller ball, which is maybe $100. The main difference is length of hospital stay. And I know as Dr. McLaughlin said last week, it's difficult in a system uh, such as ours to, to get monetary value from length of hospital stay. But if you can do this as an outpatient procedure and not have your procedures the following day canceled, it then becomes a, an access issue. Um, so definitely if you, if you are requiring uh, less overtime nursing, um, all of these conclusions were that uh, PVP actually came out on top. The main, the main thing swaying in that is the length of hospital stay. So the conclusions from this meta-analysis uh, out of Alberta were that, you know, there is limited clinical evidence, but all of the findings across the studies were consistent. Uh, they showed an acceptable safety profile uh, consistent with uh, TURP. Uh, efficacy seemed to be no worse. Uh, and in fact, uh, with hospitalization time, catheterization rates, and uh, uh, economics, it might have actually come out on top. Um, and at 12 months, which was the maximum, there was no difference in clinical outcome. Um, so let's take a look at the other study. There's this uh, other study actually hasn't been printed yet. <coughs> it has been accepted and, and uh, submitted in Ontario. <laughs> Um, but has not uh, yet been in print. It was a systematic review and meta-analysis done out of Ontario who only looked at uh, randomized control trials, so they didn't look at the case control studies that the other one did. There was only three randomized control studies, one coming out of uh, Australia, uh, one out of Turkey, and, and then one back in 2002 out of Mississippi. The uh, one out of Turkey only looked at glands greater than 70 grams, 70 to 100 grams. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, the, the comment from Dr. Cron was that um, Dr. Malik from the Mayo Clinic hasn't, uh, it does not make this list for randomized control trials. So when we look at uh, the studies included there, there were three randomized control studies, follow-up range between 6 and 36 months. When they looked at the data on IPSS scores, Change in IPSS uh, score from baseline uh, was not statistically significantly different between uh, TURP and PVP, nor was uh, QMAX. Uh, uh, however, length of catheterization and uh, length of hospitalization uh, stay did favor uh, PVP. The conclusions that this analysis uh, came up with, it. yes, there is limited data out there. There's limited randomized control trial data. There are methodologic flaws, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, the, there's lack of long-term follow-up on this, the max here being 36 months. Um, but overall, there are possible advantages to green light laser. 
Uh, there's less clot retention that was demonstrated. There's shorter duration of catheterization. And we get back to that shorter length of hospitalization. Being able to do this is an outpatient procedure. Uh, Dr. Wright's question was whether or not any of those sites included in the randomized control trials were doing daycare TUPRs uh, prior to doing this study, and, and I, I'm not sure if they were doing daycare uh, TUPRs at those sites. Um, but when you look at their, their data versus TUPR and their length of the hospital stay, we're looking at their, their stay was between three and four days. So. Um, those numbers are a little bit uh, different than our experience here, that's for sure. Um, so, Dr. Patterson. Uh, so the, the, the comment I'll try to summarize from uh, Dr. Patterson for those out of town are that uh, from previous costing results at the, the Vancouver Coastal, they approximate the cost of a bed to be $427 for a ward bed. And that if you're doing a TURP uh, with a length of stay of one day, it's hard to justify this increased cost. The only comment I can make on that is that we're comparing the averages of PVP to the best case scenario of TURP. In the best case, they get out the same day. Uh, on average, I would, you know, we we see the the larger prostates, uh, people with comorbidities, people who are anticoagulated. Um, you know, their stays can be substantial. They can be three, four, five days. So I'm wondering if 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 we actually looked at our numbers for TURP, yes, best case scenario, they get out in one day. What's our average? Is our average two days? You know, yeah. 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 So, so the, you know, Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
the, there's a comment from Dr. Wright that I'll try to summarize. Uh, Brian, you're wrong. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyways, you know, all I can go from is, uh, is, is two large economic analyses that were done in Canada by the University of Alberta, Edmonton, and the University of uh, Ottawa and Ontario. And, you know, to look at their numbers, they, I, I'm hoping that their hospitalization stays don't cost them far more, but people who are far smarter than me in, in, in uh, economics have done these analyses. And they, they were coming out with numbers on average uh, 800 to, you know, $1,200 difference between the cases. And, and actually the final conclusion by the <coughs> University of Alberta was that if they look at this over a five-year span, they, they expected that if all TURP went to PVP that they could save their system $3 million. So these are, these are large analyses done by, by the um, economics department at that university hospital. So, you know, that's, you know, far better than, than, than I can sort of uh, project. <coughs> The, okay, Dr. Wright's uh, point on that was that uh, the prairies people are way behind. He spends enough time in the prairies. Um, okay, so enough about those uh, randomized trials. There's a couple special circumstances that, that might make PVP uh, favorable. Dr. Leone. Dr. Leone's comment there was that uh, certainly most decisions now in this economy are being made on money and uh, that it might be prudent for Vancouver sites and all the different hospitals to do an analysis such as this. Yeah, the, the comment from, from Dr. Nigro is that it's a, it's a select population that we see at the tertiary care centers and have to keep that in mind as well. Uh, that being said, Edmonton um, is a tertiary care hospital as well. So, uh, let's look at some special circumstances or considerations here. Um, uh, do, are these findings real? There's only two published studies that actually show objective evidence that PVP does anything. There's two urodynamic studies, one with 12-month follow-up and the other one with follow-up just after they had their PVP. And in the first study, um, there was statistically significant improvement in QMAX, uh, PDET at QMAX, and max intrusive pressure, and uh, urethral thing pressure as well as post void residual, which uh, these findings were mimicked in the, the second urodynamic study. So there is some sort of conclusive evidence that we're not just lazing, you know, waving a laser over these people and they go, oh, I'm way better. Um, what about volumes? When does the size of the prostate matter? And in this study of 102 Japanese patients, it, uh, admittedly a high volume uh, center, they stratified them into prostate volumes less than 40 cc's, 40 to 80, and greater than 80. And uh, in their 102 patient study population, they were not able to find any differences in clinical outcomes based upon prostate size other than the section time. Um, now, if you're going to start doing big prostates, what about just doing it open or whole up? Now, there's no studies that look at PVP head-to-head uh, -head with whole up. Um, the one criticism that you read about whole up is the learning curve, and there, therefore there's very few people who do it in Canada. So for the big prostates, uh, open simple prostatectomy seems to be the gold standard, of course. Um, this. Uh, uh, study, they actually randomized people between green light laser and uh, open simple prostatectomy. 
Um, they had to have a gland larger than 80 cc's. They were looked at at 1, 3, 6, 12, and 18 months uh, postoperatively, and the primary endpoints um, that they looked at were, again, the IPSS quality of life score, flow rates, post-void residual, and then at 18 months they looked at the reoperative rate. Uh, and actually, interestingly, the uh, PVP in these larger prostates uh, had equivalent clinical outcomes, uh, but did have shorter time of catheterization, less um, hospital stay, and lower transfusion rates. Uh, small study, but, you know, they were doing glands in this study. The biggest gland was 256 grams. The extent of resection wasn't uh, reported, but the clinical outcomes seemed to be okay. Uh, one of the bonuses to this is that those patients that you can't take off of anticoagulation uh, that now are going to Dr. Patterson for the whole up, it gives the, the opportunity to do a laser prostate in these people. There's no uh, differences in clinical outcomes that have been proven in, in multiple studies. They do have longer irrigation times, longer hospital stay, uh, and should, be, should never be done on an outpatient uh, basis. Um, but uh, it is feasible and safe with no change in uh, adverse events profile. Um, of course, you know, you should stop anticoagulation if possible, but uh, in those patients that you can't, this might be, might be an option. Uh, we've already heard lots of criticisms uh, about this uh, technology, but some of the common ones are that there is no long-term data uh, per se. Um, and what is the retreatment rate? Are we only taking half of the gland? Uh, or part of the gland, and, and then, then another one gets into, you, you no longer have tissue to look at. So, you know, Dr. High, um, out of Detroit, who is well known in this field, uh, he looked at 321 patients in the early 2000s with the 80-watt laser, and just recently published his five-year data. They looked at uh, uh, pretreatment and five-year um, primary endpoints, and uh, when you look at this, the AUA symptom score, quality of life, pardon me, voiding volume, flow rates, um, all looked uh, statistically uh, improved from baseline, showing some durability of, uh, of the results at five years. Uh, the important question being how many of those had to be redone. Um, and interestingly, uh, in them, the retreatment rate uh, was approximately 10% at five years. Um, if you look at the large study uh, out of Austria, there was a nationwide study of 23,000 TURP patients, uh, their retreatment rate was reported at 12%. And uh, the AUA guidelines uh, say that the retreatment rate for TURP is somewhere between 8 and 15% at eight years. So in this single center, his retreatment rate wasn't that different from what you would expect for TURP. Uh, the lack of histopathologic diagnosis, um, you know, the question is whether or not that's important. You're only sampling the transition zone in BPH. And this one study uh, by Byers looked at, you know, how many of these cancers that are incidentally found uh, are important. And they found that only about 5% of newly diagnosed cancers were from TURP specimen. And uh, at four years of follow-up, none of these had gone on to any sort of treatment. You know, in prostate cancer years, that's very short. Um, but I guess in the back of our mind, when we're making that criticism, you know, is it important that we find it? So I, d I don't personally see that as a contraindication. Uh, in this era of PSA and DRE, we have that as well. So. so, you know, my objective at the beginning of this talk prior to getting it was to be able to sort of come in front of you and say, why is anyone out there doing green light? And I. I unfortunately can't do that. I think the data is sort of saying that maybe green light is something that, uh, that is of clinical use. It uh, appears to have uh, an efficient or uh, a safety profile equal or, or slightly better than TURP. There's less blood transfusion, shorter time of catheterization, and shorter hospital stays. Um, and the fact that the majority of these are done on an outpatient basis is... is uh, encouraging. Uh, it might have use in those anticoagulated patients that now are going for hole up or, or bridging anticoagulation. And again, enlarged prostates gives us another option. 
uh, as we saw, the cost analysis of the ones that have been published have favored PVP as well, and I think it would be prudent to in Vancouver site to do a similar cost analysis. Uh, may, again, the, the cost difference is mainly on hospital stay. Um, you know, it's a new, relatively new technology. The data is, is evolving. Uh, so we need to sort of see where we want to be on that curve. And uh, as Dr. Goldenberg said last week, talking about the robot, uh, at what point do you uh, jump on the steamroller uh, as opposed to being coming part of the road? So I'd like to, uh, at that close, and thank uh, Dr. So uh, for helping me with this presentation and Dr. Leone for his uh, help with the video. Well, I'm glad to have you.